Welcome to Your Infinite Health. Are you getting older? Are you feeling it? How would you like to do that in reverse? We're your host, Dr. Tripp, and Lene. We've run an integrative medicine practice for 13 years. Together, we have 60 years of combined experience helping clients. We've helped tens of thousands achieve success in health and live longer, happier lives. In this show, we'll cover peer-reviewed and evidence-based integrative approaches to creating the health you've always wanted. We also share professional experience we see in the field every day. So if you're ready to feel, look, and live your best life, you're in the right place. Welcome to your Infinite Health Podcast. Hey guys, so you're just kind of stuck with me today because I left Trip at home. Bless his heart. He worked all week, worked hard all week, and I let him sleep in. And I had to get up and come into the office because I had to take Hayden to school anyway. And so I took Hayden to school and then I hit the Starbucks. Don't tell anybody. Now I'm here recording with a great guest. And this guest has is bringing a wealth of information about a topic that I don't think people really, I don't think there's a lot of awareness about it. I think it's just one of those things that people just kind of gloss over and they're like, yeah, I'll worry about that later. But I find the information very deep and rich. I hope you do too. If you think it doesn't apply to you, I promise you it's going to apply to somebody you love. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. John Newstead, ND. He has an international reputation as a doctor, researcher, and integrative medical expert. He became renowned in this field through his nutritional medicine research, clinical work, the books he's written, working with the FDA on evaluating the use of natural products for the potential treatment of rare diseases, developing million-dollar businesses, educating physicians on improving patient outcomes, and the general public on how to make sure that they are getting the care they need and the results they want. And as a medical expert advising businesses on product development and how to create super fan, Dr. Newstead has published more than 100 uh, medical articles, written four health and wellness books, and is now a number one Amazon bestselling author in the field of osteoporosis. His most recent book is Fracture Proof Your Bones, a comprehensive guide to osteoporosis. Dr. Newstead was also an editor of the textbook Laboratory Evaluations for the Integrative and Functional Medicine, which was used across the United States to train and educate physicians on using functional medicine with their patients. Dr. Newstead is a highly sought out speaker at medical conferences. He was recognized as one of the top 10 cited authors in the world for his work. His research on integrative and functional medicine has been featured in the Natural Medicine Journal, Integrative Medicine, a Clinician's Journal, Holistic Primary Care, Molecular Nutrition and Food Research, and Experimental and Molecular Pathology. He earned his naturopathic medical degree from Bastyr University, where he was awarded the Founders Award for Academic and Clinical Excellence. He opened his clinic Montana Integrative Medicine in 2005 in Bozeman, Montana. He specializes in hard-to-treat chronic degenerative diseases through an integrative approach that emphasizes identifying, correcting the underlying cause of the disease. For his clinical work, Dr. Newstead was the first naturopathic doctor to be voted best doctors among all physicians in his area. When the award was announced, this is what the local newspaper had to say, quote, it is noteworthy that Dr. Newstead did not win, quote, best natro, naturopathic doctor, but he won best doctor. That is a lot of awesome information. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Newstead. Hey, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Newstead. Newstead? Newstead? Nustad, I saw you put phonetically phonetical helpers in your bio. <laughs> that was nice. It can be a little challenging sometimes for people to pronounce my name. Unless I'm in Germany. When I was in Germany, nobody misspelled it or mispronounced it. But, really? Uh, it can be challenging. So it, is that your that's your dis, your descendant from the Germans? Uh from that area, yes. Very nice. And you said you're in San Diego. What's What's going on in San Diego? Well, just like many days out of the year, it's sunny and gorgeous, uh, beautiful weather, not too humid. Um, 
a little cooler than normal uh, here in, in being in the winter, but uh, it's great. I'll probably still be in shorts today. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's nice. It, it's got, it was really humid here this morning, but I think it's going to rain in New Orleans, you know, whatever. It comes, it goes, it rains, it makes your hair yeah, flat. I've been there a couple of times. It's steamy. It gets really. <laughs> it does get hot. quite, it does get quite steamy. Um, well, I want to kind of go to your origin story and um, tell everybody how, like, what got you into medicine? And then specifically, what got you into your passion for functional medicine? I was working in Seattle as a project manager at different software companies and was miserable. I, I hated it. It was the wrong profession for my personality. I could literally go into the office and everything I needed was on the servers. I could go in and not have to talk to another human being for two or three days. And that wow. drove me a little nuts. I love people. I love interacting with people. I love learning about people. And so I was just in the wrong profession. I started to get sick. And at the time I didn't have a doctor. I was in my twenties, like most 20 year olds. I was, I was healthy and active and I picked a doctor out of the list of what my insurance would cover. Had mm -hmm. no idea who he was. Went in to see him and he walked into the room with his prescription pad in his hand. And I started asking he was questions. Ready. <laughs> he was ready. I started asking questions to understand what was going on with me. I wanted to be empowered. I want to have a better understanding of things that I could do to heal and prevent it from happening again, to improve my health. I was ready to be an active participant. He wasn't ready to be an active participant in my health, however, and he became more and more obviously agitated that it was taking too long. He was, seemed to me like he was just wanting to write the prescription and get on to the next patient. And he did. He wrote me a prescription and off he went. And I left there feeling dissatisfied. I understand and I understood at the time that medicine is a service industry and I wasn't getting the service that I wanted, needed, or deserved. And I had heard about naturopathic medicine living in Seattle. There's a, one of the most prominent naturopathic medical schools in the area, Bastyr University. And I'd heard about them. Their teaching clinic was just down the street. So I thought, yeah, let me see what these folks have to say. What do they have to offer? I went in. The clinician, the supervising clinician uh, was still, uh, was and is still the chief medical officer there. And two students saw me, 45 minute appointment. None of my questions were, uh, were minimized. They took time with me. They answered my questions. They helped me understand what I could do uh, for my own health. They weren't uh, wanting to write a prescription. They knew there were other ways to handle this. And one of the philosophical beliefs of naturopathic medicine is to treat the underlying cause. The chief medical officer, Dr. Jamie Wallace, the supervisor, got to know me so well within that appointment that at the very end, he looked at me and he said, you need to quit your job. Oh. He understood that the stress from that profession and me really not wanting to be doing it, but I had golden handcuffs at the time, was creating my illness and it was stress induced primarily. And at that point in my life, it was the third party validation that I needed to do what I already understood that I should be doing, which is leaving that profession into transferring, transitioning into something else. I was interested in integrative medicine. I was interested in health, my background. I have a degree in botany where I uh, focused on the molecular and cellular biology of plants and uh, plants in commerce and medicine, a kind of field of study called ethnobotany. And I was looking at medical schools already and kind of thinking about it. And I, he gave me the push I needed. So I, I left my job the next week and started applying uh, for medical school, looked at different programs, decided that naturopathic medical school was the best fit for me because while some schools like DO programs have some nutritional components to their, their curriculum. I also, with a background in botany, wanted the botanical medicine component. I wanted the holistic 
medicine, the functional medicine component from the beginning. And so that's how I transitioned and went back to school in my late 20s, early 30s to uh, medical school. And then when I got out, I started my practice in Montana. We were there for six years. Oh, nice. uh, and it, yeah. And, and I never saw myself focusing on bone health and osteoporosis, but patients started coming to me with this problem. And my mother-in-law has osteoporosis. She was taking Fosamax. She was doing some of the things that I'd recommended in terms of lifestyle and, and diet. And I was working with my patients and helping them. And their bone density test results were going up. My mother-in-law's bone density tests were going up and improving. And then she tripped and fell and broke her hip. Oh. And I thought something's wrong with this picture. What is going on? Because by that objective measure of the bone density test, she should have been protected. It wasn't even a hard fall. And what I discovered, I started looking into the research is that that focus, almost exclusive focus in conventional medicine on just changing that number on the test is woefully inadequate. We've known since the 1990s, it's been in the research that a bone density test predicts less than half of people who will break a bone. And now we understand that for women with osteoporosis, it only predicts 44% of them who will fracture and only 21% of men. Fracture risk, in fact, depends on factors largely other than bone density. And yet that is almost exclusively what is being discussed with patients by clinicians. And I just kept going further and further and further into the research and trying to figure out how I can help people. 17, 18 years later, here I am, an expert in osteoporosis with my book out, lecturing at medical conferences to help teach clinicians how to move the needle on this very dangerous and uh, disease that is becoming more and more common as the population ages. And so I really appreciate this opportunity to share what I've, I've, I've learned to hopefully help your listeners as well. Yeah, I think the listeners will um, really value um, what you're bringing to their awareness today. So tell me more about, so how do you treat somebody naturally for bone health? Is that a lifestyle focused um, methodology? It is, it is, there is definitely lifestyle that's important to, to consider. And look, like all chronic diseases, at least all chronic diseases that I'm aware of, diet and lifestyle components are main drivers of the disease process. And it's no different with, with bone health. I mean, bone health is essentially a disease of imbalance where the destructive forces are winning. And it's our job to rebalance that system, that physiology, the tissue, the bone tissue, and and help create an environment for the cells in our bones to do what they want to do anyway, which is be healthy and function as optimally as we can. Because we can, you can rebuild bone once you've lost bone. Really? Oh, absolutely. I didn't know that. It used to be taught that it's basically a one-way street. You reach your peak bone density in, in your 20s, and then you know it's this fatalistic attitude of it's all downhill from there. Right. And that's just not accurate. It, it's not true. And it really is a depressing thought when I think about it, if that's the attitude that, that patients are being confronted with by their, their clinicians, because it doesn't, the body doesn't actually work that way. And the research is clear. We can reverse this absolutely using integrative and natural approaches. It's well-documented in in the research. So what does that look like for you when somebody comes to see you and they're, uh, they need to recover bone loss? Like your, was it your mother-in-law? Did you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's 93 now, still, still alive, still moving around. Awesome. Uh, so one of the things that, that I look at, first of all, one of the things I do, cause it can be, you know, people are anxious when they get the result. It's scary. It's a scary diagnosis and a scary disease. And, and people are correct in being concerned about their future when they get this diagnosis, because if you're a woman age 65 and you fracture a hip, there's up to a 36% chance that you're going to be dead. And half oh of those people ne- never recover their full activities, you know, full pain-free lifestyle and mobility they had. And about 20 to 30% get 
never recover their their activities of daily living, meaning where they can independently dress themselves or go shopping or go to the bathroom independently. You know, that's wow. how debilitating it can be. And in fact, a woman's risk of an osteoporosis fracture is equal to her risk for her combined risk for breast, uterine, and ovarian cancer. Wow. Uh, and every 30 seconds somewhere, someone is breaking a bone due to osteo. Uh, I don't think stuff. anybody, you know, you really don't hear about that issue. I don't think that's in prominent awareness. And it, this, those statistics, that's crazy. And that's part of the challenge because doctors are treating a number on a test and they're not treating the patient sitting in front of them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're treating what's called a surrogate marker, that, that test result. But a test result is not what we're trying to prevent or trying to help. What we're trying to help is somebody not to get a fracture. That's the most clinically relevant and dangerous result of osteoporosis. So all questions around this disorder, in my opinion, should be focused on that very simple question. You know, if you're being recommended something, the question is, has it been shown in clinical trials to you know, not only improve bone density, but has it been shown more importantly to reduce fractures? Or if you're getting a test, the question is, you know, how predictive, how well does this test predict my fractures, risk for fractures? So when it comes to this, you know, more integrative and holistic approach, you know, first I like to put the test result in its proper context and tell people, look, take a deep breath. This is serious, but it's not an emergency. There is time to educate yourself and put together a holistic bone health plan that makes sense for you. And then I dig in with patients. I dig in with people and I say, okay, the first thing we want to do in trying to heal is let's see if there are things in your life that are damaging bone, that are creating the problem that we can minimize or totally get rid of. One of the most obvious categories of that, one of the biggest and most common problems people are having is with medications. Medication-induced bone damage, medication-induced fractures. There is a long list of medications that create, that damage bone and increase fracture risk. And unfortunately, it's a blind spot for most clinicians. They're not aware of this. And so it's imperative that people educate themselves. And that's why there's a whole chapter in my book on medication-induced osteoporosis. It's called, you know, check your medicine cabinet. And just to give you some examples, some of the most commonly prescribed medications, antidepressants, anything that artificially increases serotonin. So there's serotonin receptors in bone. And when that's artificially increased by these medications like, you know, Prozac and Lexapro, Wellbutra, you know, those kind of medications that it increases the activity of a type of cell called osteoclasts osteoclasts break down and recycle old worn out bone. And then another type of cell called osteoblast build up, builds up new bone. That's a process called remodeling, which is crucial for bone health. It's natural, it's normal. And when it's healthy and imbalanced, you have healthy bone being produced and enough of it. In, in fact, bone turnover, it's such a natural process that, and happening all the time that you know, every 10 years, you essentially have all new bone. Mm. It's all been remodeled every 10 years, turned over. But when you have medications that are, that are increasing bone destruction, you lose that balance. And in fact, research has looked at you know, how many patients taking these medications are at risk for fractures and has concluded that for uh, somebody taking a... SSRI or SNRI, you know, those category of medications that increase, uh, increase serotonin, that for every 19 people taking them for more than one year, one of them will break a bone. Wow. And that is that, um, that's both genders, and, right? Yeah, it's primarily looked at. So for it, that medication is mostly prescribed to women. Okay. And the, the, it is primarily the data is primarily skewed towards towards women. But I, it may be a different story in men, but I, I'm not so sure it is. Well, uh, it seems like the majority of the population, at least on the road when I'm driving to work, is on 
something like that. So I think a lot of people are, are well, it gets into another issue with overprescribing things erroneously, but it's kind of scary to think how many people are on those because they're so easily doled out yes. and um, they probably are not aware of the risk to the bone. They're not and their doctors aren't. And there was a study that came out that looked at patients who ended up in the hospital because of a fracture with osteoporosis. And they looked at the medications that they were taking in the months prior to going into the hospital. And then what they were taking once they left the hospital. And what they found is that their doctors who, you know, maybe de-prescribed or, or changed them off a medication that they knew was creating uh, fracture risk and osteoporosis, they just put them on a different medication that did the same thing that they weren't aware that it was doing that. And so there was actually, there was no net benefit at all. Oh, and, wow. And back, you know, back to my point, it's a real blind spot conventionally with clinicians. So it's important to ask your pharmacist and, you know, really have this conversation with your doctor and ask them to look it up. I teach people in the book, they can actually go and look this up themselves in terms of adverse events and how to do that to be an educated consumer of medicine. Another category of medications quite common is the proton pump inhibitors, the acid blocking medications. Okay. Those are also damage bone to the point where people taking them continuously, you know, for four years have a, up to a 60% increased risk in hip fractures. And people are just popping these like candy. They're available over the counter. Uh, even after one to two years, you know, that risk is already going up. So but you that's, said it's an acid reducer, so like a Tums? No, no a, a Tums is not the same thing. So okay. it's a, it's called a proton pump inhibitor, like the little purple pill, Prilosec. Oh, okay. The common name of that. It blocks the production of acid. Tums just is a buffer. It's calcium carbonate. It just buffers the acid to reduce the, to increase the pH. Got the it. The actual proton pump inhibitors, they block the mechanism that your stomach uses to produce acid. So your stomach acid goes down and it creates a whole host of, of problems. Um, half of those prescriptions are written just for one condition, which is acid reflux, which is, you know, through a functional approach, dietary changes, you know, a lot of people can, you know, not need that medication anymore just by making some simple changes to, uh, to their diet. And similarly with depression, with the antidepressant medications through functional approach and an integrative approach, you know, we can work with people identifying if they have certain nutritional deficiencies, supplement them, replenish them if they're deficient. And for many people, they can be able to decrease their dose or discontinue that altogether when they work with the right docs. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we find a lot of hormonally imbalanced people are being diagnosed with depression and anxiety and those types of labels when in fact, when you optimize your hormones and get your metabolics the way that they should be, then those symptoms dissipate. Absolutely. And that, that's a great introduction then into the role of hormones in bone health. Mm. And you know, serotonin is a hormone. Um, and as I just mentioned with the medication, when you artificially increase it, uh, there are serotonin receptors in bone and not just in the brain. In fact, most of the serotonin is not even in the brain. About 90% is produced in the gut and it not even, doesn't even enter the brain and it can impact then bone health. There are other hormones that can affect mood as well, that when they drop like testosterone or estrogen, not only do they impact mood, but they impact bone as well. In fact, when a woman goes through menopause and for the 10 years after her estrogen has dropped, that's the fastest rate of bone loss that she'll have in her lifetime. That's when we often see osteoporosis develop, although it can develop much younger as well. And so replenishing estrogen replacement therapy, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy can be quite helpful. The research is clear when it comes to hormone replacement therapy in women with osteoporosis, that when you get that hormone back into the normal range, and I'm not talking about super, you know, high dose, I'm just, you know, hormones that's low, which is exactly what you're talking about, just getting it back into the normal, healthy range. That, well, optimal. That's I would say optimal because- Great, I think, optimal even better. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes nor normal is not 
you know, if you're looking at the bell curve of what most doctors are looking at, normal is not generally optimal for most people. So just clarification. Great point. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. When you get it back into that optimal range with hormone replacement therapy in women, it's associated with a 40% reduction in fracture risk for osteoporosis and hip fractures, which are the most dangerous type of fractures. Uh, it's been shown to have a 28% reduction in hip fracture risk. Uh, I did not know those statistics. That's really encouraging. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. And there was you know studies that came out years ago about the dangers of, of hormone replacement therapy that's been largely debunked. Yes, there is a subset of a population where that can be a risk and people just need to be screened for that. But it can be done very safely when you're working with the, the right doc. Right. I Well, and I will speak to that issue because we hear it a lot with um, misinformation being perpetuated by um, various physicians. Those studies were largely based on synthetics right. and not bioidentical. So yeah, it's it's interesting and unfortunate really that there's still misinformation being perpetuated about bioidentical hormones or hormone replacement. Well, the look, medical doctors and naturopathic doctors, Diaz, we're all, we're all taught you know, the, the first principle of medicine is, is, you know, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the misrepresentation of science, the suppression of certain studies, the lack of access in conventional medical settings and the lack of training within conventional medical schools of nutritional medicine, mm -hmm. that the science is so clear on uh, is incredibly helpful for many diseases, not only to prevent uh, or reduce the severity of diseases, but but to reverse them and it can actually cure people, that that's not being taught, really violates that first principle of medicine of first do no harm. And so yeah. when I when I meet doctors like you, you know your husband and and you and clinics like yours who are are, are pioneers in this and working to in a functional uh, manner to to help you work with the body's biochemistry, with the body's physiology to, to reestablish balance, to improve patient care and improve outcomes, not just reflexively you know, um, prescribing a pharmaceutical, like the experience that my MD wanted to do many years ago. And in fact, 75% of all primary care visits involve a prescription medication. I mean, that is to me absurd and it's creating a lot of harm. Right. I, I agree. How does one fix their sleep? Sleep is a, an often overlooked component with bone health. And yeah, fact, you wouldn't necessarily connect the two. Right. And a lot of people don't. And But it is an important thing to look at, not just for bone health, but if you're not sleeping well, uh, if you have insomnia, it's also associated with increased risk of diabetes, increased risk of dementia, increased risk of cardiovascular disease and early death, high blood pressure. Uh, so it's, it's not a good situation and osteoporosis. So what we do know with sleep is that there are generally, you know, two, two phases of, of, of sleep. So that's people, you know, sleep phase, what's called sleep phase delay um, or sleep phase advance. And that is the question I like to ask patients is, are you having difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep? And for me, depending on the answer of that question, the the approach might be a little different. So if somebody's having difficulty falling asleep, then it could be situational. It could be because of anxiety. It could be they just they need stress reduction. Uh, exercise has been shown to be very helpful at at improving sleep outcomes as well. It could be hormonal imbalances. Uh, it's very clear that you know maybe they're getting hot flashes because they, they have low uh, estrogen. Uh, maybe they they are not sleeping well because they can't turn off their mind. And, and, and that could also be not just situational, but, but also hormone imbalances, which can create anxiety uh, as well. Mm -hmm. It could be that somebody just needs a little help. Maybe they've got tight muscles and they can't get into a comfortable uh, position. You know, magnesium is a very gentle muscle relaxer that, that may be able to help. And there are, there are lots of herbs and and amino acids that have been shown to sort of help promote healthy sleep that, that we can look at to use. And in fact, after years of looking into this, I created a, a product called Sleep Relief that, that, uh, that both it's a time release biphasic delivery system tablet that helps, helps target both of those phases. So if somebody's having a hard time falling asleep, 
and staying asleep. And if they're having a hard time staying asleep, you know, it could be partly because of blood sugar control issues. It could be because of, uh, they can, again, they can't get comfortable because of muscle tightness or pain. It could be they're having acid reflux um, and that's waking them up. In, in which case, again, just some simple dietary changes might be helpful. So it's important to not just say, oh, you're not sleeping well here, take some melatonin. Because what happens a lot of times with melatonin is people take some and it was intended, you know, how it works in the body is it helps people fall asleep, but it's not involved really in helping people stay asleep throughout the night. And so people can fall asleep and then they wake up in the middle of the night and they can't go back to sleep. And so they take a higher dose of melatonin and then a higher dose and then a higher dose until they just knock themselves out and they wake up in the morning and they feel drugged and, and groggy and, and, and foggy headed. And that's not good either. So having some melatonin may be helpful. And there's some research with melatonin. There's one clinical trial in women with osteopenia, that's pre-osteoporosis and melatonin, showing that one or three milligrams of melatonin per day improve bone density. Now, they didn't look at fractures as the outcome and hopefully future studies will. But that's the link with melatonin and sleep and bone health. There are melatonin receptors on bone, just like huh. there are serotonin receptors in bone. Who knew? <laughs> So exactly what is the connection though? I mean, are are you are you losing bone density if you're not sleeping well? You you there's an association with poor sleep, lack of sleep and uh osteoporosis or low bone density. Now, what's interesting and I think it's important to understand is is osteoporosis you know in terms of diagnosing it and what the studies use is based on a bone density test. That bone density test only detects the amount of minerals in bone, but minerals are only one component of bone. There are about 200 proteins in bone as well. The most common protein is collagen. And it's the collagen in bone, that connective tissue in bone that gives it its ultimate strength and quality, not the minerals. The minerals give bone its quantity. So what you can have in the connection with sleep here is, is yes, you're losing bone mineral density, but insomnia and lack of sleep also increases uh, inflammation. It increases cortisol. And both of those not only strip the bone of minerals, but damages collagen. It makes collagen less flexible. So when your collagen's healthy, just like in a chicken bone, if you were to take a chicken bone and soak it in vinegar and pull all the minerals out, you're left with the collagen and the proteins. And it's like a rubber chicken bone. You can bend it, you can stomp it, you can hit it against a table. It will not break just like your own bones when that, you know, if, if the collagen were healthy and intact and you, you got rid of all the minerals. And so helping, you know, focusing on that component of the bone as well is, is important, not just focusing on the minerals, but that's how lack of sleep and increased stress and chronic inflammation damages bone. It can reduce the amount of minerals, but it also damages that extracellular matrix, those proteins in bone as well. Oh, okay. Got it. Fascinating. Okay. Let's move into digestion and bone health. There's an intimate connection between the gut and your bones. Uh, chronic inflammation in the gut. I just mentioned chronic inflammation before. If there's leaky gut, if there's inflammation in the gut and it gets through, passes through the gut lining, those molecules and into your circulation, it directly impacts bone to destroy, destroy bone. Oh, wow. And then there is um, malabsorption that can occur where people aren't absorbing enough of the of, of the important nutrients that everything in our body needs, but particularly for this discussion that, that bones need, the vitamins and minerals and short chain fatty acids, that if you have a dysbiosis or you have malabsorption, you have chronic inflammation, those all sort of conspire to work against your bones and your bone health. And there's some crosstalk between your digestive system and the bone. There's a protein in bone uh, called osteocalcin that's involved also now we understand in insulin sensitivity. And that's important for maintaining healthy blood sugar, for helping to reduce sugar cravings and improving digestion. 
So there's, there is a connection now. We understand that the bone is connected to every other system uh, in, the, in the body. You know, there's a brain bone connection. There's an endocrine or hormone bone connection. There's a gut bone connection. Because bones do more than just give us structural integrity, allow us to stand up and walk and jump and hug our loved ones and protect our internal organs. Bones also produce our blood cells our red blood cells, our white blood cells for our immune system and our platelets. It, do, it does a lot of jobs. And so there's cross talk be connection between bone and every other system in the body. I have to say, I never conceptualized that really. I mean, I think not that I gave it much thought, but thinking that the skeletal system was just exactly that, just the structure that everything else was hanging on or whatever. Well, because I think that's what we've been taught. I mean, that that's, that's, traditionally how bones have been uh, discussed and 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 it's sort of this you know disconnect mm -hmm. where they they take the, the different functions of, of bone you know structural bone as structural elements in the body bone is producing blood elements in the body and they separate that in terms of specialty medical specialty and education so you've got hematology that deals with just the bone aspect the blood aspect of what the bone's doing and then you've got, you know, orthopedics that, that may look at, you know, bone as a structural issue and joints as a structural issue. And, and, and so they're, they're, they're sort of slicing and dicing this dynamic system into different component parts where if you think functionally and you want to work in an integrative fashion to actually promote the health of the body and the health of your bones, it doesn't work. You can't, that, that conceptual framework is too limiting. Yeah, for sure. And and even when it comes to the gut, when it comes to nutrients, you know, there are you know, I mentioned all the, the the proteins that I that I talked about in bone. You know, the amount of protein somebody consumes can account for 2 to 4% of bone mineral density. You know, that's just protein within the normal range. But even as we age, the amount of protein required to maintain healthy bone and muscle is inadequate to, you know, for your bone health and for muscle health to prevent falls and fall related injuries like fractures. So the research now is recommending a higher amount than the USRDA. We're looking at about, you know, if you take your body weight and multiply it by 0 0.6, that's the number of grams your body weight in pounds times 0 0.6. That's the number of grams of protein you should be getting a day. So minimum. So for me, that's 90 grams of protein. That's a lot. And I strive for that, but I don't always get there. And that's where dietary supplements come in. I'm a believer that, that people should use dietary supplements you know, as the FDA intended when they pass the legislation. And that is as a supplement to a healthy diet, always lifestyle and diet should come first, but there right. are certain nutrients where you just can't get enough in the diet sometimes. And even all the time in one case, I'll tell you about where it is crucial to supplement that diet in order to get the, get into that optimal range, as you mentioned before. And so protein is one of those, you know, calcium and vitamin D are supplements or nutrients that people uh, think about, you know, immediately when they think about bone health and osteoporosis, most people are probably getting too much calcium. They don't need to supplement with a thousand milligrams typically of calcium as a dietary supplement. For most people getting a dietary supplement, maybe 400 milligrams a day is adequate to get them into that healthy range of, you know, 1200 milligrams per day for women is what's recommended. And that's from all sources, right? Diet and dietary supplements. But there's a specific form of vitamin K2 that you cannot consume in high enough doses in food to get the amount of that nutrient shown in clinical trials to actually work and help you. So it's specifically, I'm talking about a form of vitamin K2 called MK4. Now, there are different types of vitamin K2 you see in dietary supplements, MK7 and MK4. L only MK4 has been shown not only to promote healthy bone density, but to maintain strong bones as indicated by over 70% fewer fractures in clinical trials. Wow. MK7, in contrast, has only been shown to slow down how fast somebody loses bone. And there are no clinical trials that have looked at fractures and whether or not it actually reduces fractures. 
MK4 has been so well studied that since 1995, it's been approved by the Ministry of Health in Japan for bone health. And the clinical, the dose used in the clinical trials and shown to work is 45 milligrams per day. Most of wow. the time people see very low doses like microgram doses. This is thousands of times more. It's safe. There are long-term studies uh, that have been done. It is completely safe in terms of not creating any increased risk for blood clots or any other dangerous uh, issues. And the MK4, 45 milligrams per day, is what has been used in over 25 clinical trials and shown to work. Nice. You know, I kind of hesitate. We have pharmaceutical grade supplements that we recommend in our office, but like I stopped going to GNC because you don't know what you're really getting. And I think some studies have come out showing that a lot of those over-the-counter supplements are full of filler. So how would you recommend somebody choose a product that's actually going to be absorbed and help them? Because I think a lot of those things are just, uh, you know, money wasters. It's, it's true. And how do you know you're getting your money's worth? That's really important. In fact, I wrote an article on my website about that because it's such an port, important issue that people should learn how to evaluate dietary supplements. And you, know, you asked about you know, my, my origin story before, and I mentioned that I created a product called Sleep Relief. Well, I started a dietary supplement called MBI, it stands for Nutritional Biochemistry Incorporated, in 2006 out of my medical clinic because I couldn't find the dose and combination of nutrients shown in clinical trials to work in existing products that I needed for my patients. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to your question of how do you really know you're getting the quality? So my OsteoK and OsteoK Minis uh, products, those are my bone support products that have the 45 milligrams of MK4 in it per day, plus calcium and vitamin D, still the only products on the market with the clinical trial doses of those nutrients. Wow. that you look for citations. I tell people one of the things you can do is look for citations to see are they actually the claims that they're making, the studies that they're citing, you know, do they use the form of the nutrient and the dose of the nutrient in their product that that is actually supported by their research because I've seen unfortunately quite frequently people have to ask this but frequently you'll see a company cite a study supporting their formula, but then they'll use a lower dose, a lower amount of the nutrient than was actually used in the study and shown to work. That's terrible. So and it's not necessarily a super easy thing to evaluate and understand, uh, but that's one way to, to, to know. Another way, as you mentioned, to look at, look at fillers. Uh, for example, I don't like formulating and manufacturing with fillers. If I have extra room in my, my capsules, I like to add some additional nutrition. So for my iron product, um, Ferrisol that has, it's the highest dose ferrous bisglycinate on the market, 45 milligrams per day, which doesn't cause any GI problems, no constipation or, or uh, you know, cramping, anything like that, no nausea. I had some extra room in the capsule and so I added a little bit more glycine to it because typically when people have iron deficiency, they also feel some, they also feel anxious. Those things tend to go hand in hand. Hmm. Uh, or you look and you see, is there titanium dioxide being used? So titanium dioxide is a, a lubricant for the machinery, but it's not nutritive. So instead in my powders, my capsules, I'll use L-leucine, which is an amino acid that that our body uses for healthy things. It's used in small enough quantities and it's just considered an other, it's in the other ingredients section. But what you don't see is the titanium dioxide in there. The only product that I did have to sort of use some, some ingredients I, I, I wouldn't necessarily normally is, is when I was looking at the tablets, creating my biphasic time release sleep product, because the only way to get that is to use some some of those fillers and, and binders that I needed for the tablet. Uh, okay. But other than that, people can evaluate those. And then if they really want to just do something simple, if there are any minerals in the product, look at the supplement facts panel and look at two or three of the minerals, magnesium, copper, for example. If any of them say oxide, then it's not a great formula because your body, when a mineral is in the oxide form, you only absorb about 4% of it. 
And so if it says 100 milligrams of magnesium as magnesium oxide, you're really only absorbing maybe four milligrams of that. And the rest is going right through you and out your poop. Right. And so you're not getting your money's worth. So that's an easy way, a quick way. Just look at the, look for minerals in a product. And if any of them say oxide, you know, look for one that has more absorbable forms like a, a, a magnesium citrate or a calcium citrate. Typically you, you don't see calcium oxide. You'll see calcium carbonate, which is a poorly absorbable form of calcium. Uh, but you know, look for citrate or citrate malate or amino acid chelate. Those are all more absorbable forms of the minerals. Oh, that's an awesome tip. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Your book. Tell us about a little bit about your book and where people can get that. It's called Fracture Proof Your Bones. Uh, you can learn about it and get it on my website at nbihealth.com. And as I mentioned earlier, it walks people through understanding this, this holistic approach to bone health and what they can do in terms of how they can create it walks them through chapter by chapter, how to create your own holistic program that makes sense for you. And also there are lots of questions in there for you to ask your doctors to make sure that you're getting the best advice and recommendations because it can be overwhelming to understand, you know, should I take a medication or not? And it's important. I give you questions to ask the doctors about the medication so you can understand, is it really the best fit for you? That's then, so helpful, I think, because a lot of people just don't know. They don't know what they don't know, and they don't know how to ask those questions. So I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a labor of love, and uh, it's exciting for me to be able to, you know, I've taken this culmination of, of all these years of work and the questions I've been getting over the years, the patients I've worked with, and putting it in a format that allows me to help people beyond just one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm -hmm. But this is, if doctors are using this and actually giving it to their patients or recommending their patients says, read this. This is what you need to do. This is what we're going to do. That's awesome. And then you said you had a comprehensive medication list in there as well. It's not, I wouldn't say it's comprehensive because we're always getting uh, new information, uh, but there is a long list of medications uh, that are in the book. I'm actually, I'm working on the second edition now, and we'll be expanding that list of medications as well as adding additional chapters and expanding information in chapters as we've discovered new, new research is coming out. Cool. What is one thing you want the listener to know? I would just reemphasize that uh, if you are concerned about your bone health, if you get a bone density test result that shows you've lost bone, uh, to, to take a deep breath. It is a serious situation, but it's not an emergency. There's time for you to educate yourself, to learn more and create a program that makes sense for you. And that's the one thing that I like to leave people with. And we can reverse this. That's awesome. I appreciate that. That's, I mean, that's so encouraging, you know, one more time on the website and where people can get more information about you and get your book. NBIHealth.com. And listener, I'll have that in the, in the notes as well. Thank you so much for your time. I learned things I didn't know, and it was so helpful and encouraging to know that there are things that you can do to reverse maybe some of those bad habits that we've, you know, adopted along our way. So thank you for the opportunity. All right, listener, I hope you found this informational, educational, somewhat entertaining. And until next time. Thanks for subscribing to Your Infinite Health. I'm Dr. Tripp. And I'm Lynne. Until next time, feel it, look it, and live it.